This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Mark Moss. He is a strategic financial analyst. He's a full-time investor. He has a fantastic YouTube channel. I've learned a lot from him over the time I've been following his work, and I am really happy to bring him to you today. He was one of the early people in the cryptocurrency space, so maybe we'll talk about that a little bit and uh, some other things, namely what to expect next. Mark, welcome. How you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Looking it, forward to it. It's it's good to have you on. So um, everybody wants to know, you know, what's next, right? And and you really focus on a lot of strategy. In fact, you know, one of your handles is Strategic Mark. <laughs> I right. love it. And asset allocation and things like that. I mean, you know, maybe let's start off by talking about what do you think the best strategy is for people nowadays and with all that's going on in the world? Well, I think the best strategy for people is to recognize that nobody knows. Yep. The smart, <laughs> Good answer. The, smart, the smartest people in the world know that they don't know. Right. And so I think it's Porter Stansbury that says it's the things. Or no, it wasn't him. Maybe it was like Mark Twain. Anyway, I have so many quotes in my head. But he said yeah. uh, it's the things that you know absolutely 100 percent for certain are the things that get you in trouble. Mm hmm. And so we always have to kind of like have strong conviction, but also be quick to pivot. So um, the smartest people know that they don't know. And so what that means is the best the best strategy is something that kind of spreads out your risk, um, gives you better upside by participating in some of these things, but also limits the amount of risk that you're giving yourself. So, for example, I'm sure we'll get into Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, I, I believe, is probably the most explosive asset. It's the it's been the best performing asset for the last 11 years. Um, I believe it's the best risk r risk adjusted asset that we have today. And so many people are like, oh, it's way too risky. I would never buy it. And, and that's fine. And nobody should go 100 percent in. But like one of the best investors in the world, Paul Tudor Jones, just said that he put 2% of his portfolio towards it. So it's about like, hey, you know, this has a chance. And so let me put 1% or 2% towards right. it. It's, swing a, for the it's a small bet, and it might be a big payoff. I get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Versus, uh -huh. you know, people that put, you know, 20% plus, 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 they're taking a big risk, right? Right. Yeah. And so I think the biggest mistake that I see people make is always trying to guess what the right asset to invest into. No, no, no. I, no, don't buy Bitcoin. Only buy gold. Right. No, don't buy Bitcoin. Don't buy gold. Only buy Bitcoin. Why? Why not buy both? Mm -hmm. well, only in real estate. Well, why just real estate? Why real? Why not real estate and gold and Bitcoin? Right? Like, why do you have to choose only one? You don't have to. And so, I think that would probably be the biggest mistake that people make. The other thing, if we're just talking like big overarching kind of thesis, is my biggest thesis, my investing thesis. I pound the table on is always investing for cash flow. And you say, well, Mark, you were just talking about investing for Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't have cash flow. Uh, you're absolutely right. Part of my portfolio, of course, is for growth. But I take that growth. I take those profits from growth and I always invest them back into cash flow. So mm -hmm. cash flow is always the name of the game for me. I think uh, the lie that we've been told for whatever, 40, 50 years of, you know, go to school, get a good job, save for 40, 50 years and live off your savings is, is ridiculous. And it, we know it doesn't work because half the baby boomers today don't have any savings. Um, so that doesn't work. So um, rather than live off savings, I think we live off cash flow and it's much easier to obtain than people think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's very good. And I think that's what true investing is. It's investing for yield, for cash flow. Absolutely uh, right on on that. But I see your point about, you know, taking, you know, 2% of your net worth and uh, and putting it into a, a swing for the fences type of thing. You probably know Jason Kalkanis and, you know, he talks about investing in startups and so forth. And, you know, most of those are just total losers. You're going to lose your money. Just get ready. But you hit on one and that one could have a multiple that's really extreme if it's Facebook, for example. Okay. Right. And so so Peter Thiel would probably uh, concur with that kind of thing. So. So I agree. That's interesting. So let's talk about that allocation. Like, is there a specific percentage? I know we talked about, you know, maybe like Tudor Jones, 2% in Bitcoin, but 
how do you how do you allocate everything like that whole pie? I wish I wish there was like a one size fits all. It's not. So everybody kind of has their own what I like to call investor DNA. And so we have to figure mm-hmm. out what's right for us. Um, right. The one thing that I would say back to Paul Tudor Jones and like you talked about the guy investing in these startup companies, most of them don't make it one does. And mm-hmm. so uh, that, that's an important thing to p- pick out right there. So if you're going to invest in these risky type assets, like startup companies, for example, like a venture capitalist would, a venture capitalist is going to take their total amount they're allocating towards uh, venture capital and then divide that between you know 15 to 20 different positions. Because they know, just as you said, most are not going to make it, but a couple will hit. And so if you're just going to go for just one your chance of success is very, very low. And so you really need to go with a plan. And so like Paul Tudor Jones or like these venture capitalists, um, I'm going to take 20% of my total portfolio and put it towards startups. And of that 20%, I'm going to divide that between 10 different positions in that venture capital allocation. And so that's the way that we do it. So overall, just from a super high level, and we all need to find out what it is for us. And and the reason why it's important to find out what it is for you is because it changes. My Mm -hmm. allocation is different today than it was a year ago. And it's way different than it was 10 years ago. And so um, we need to understand how that works. And so ultimately, I, I teach something that I call the four pillar blueprint. And basically what that is, is taking your total investable assets, and breaking it down into four different categories, which is one, investing for growth. And depending mm-hmm. on how you feel, your risk tolerance, your you know time horizon, how much money you have, your sophistication level, et cetera, you might put anywhere from 20% up to 80% of your portfolio in growth. And then, of course, growth would be all these things like venture capital, Bitcoin, equity, stocks, et cetera. Part, an, uh, another one of the pillars is investing for cash flow, which we just talked about. I think that should be a big piece of someone's portfolio. In the beginning, if you only have a little bit of money, maybe you're only putting five or 10% of your portfolio towards cash flow. But as you get, uh, as you get more money, as your portfolio gets bigger, I try to put about 40 to 50% of my portfolio towards cash flow. Right. Uh, then, so, so the old saying, you know, uh, in risk what you can afford to lose, right? Yep. So as you become more wealthy, the allocation switches where you well, I don't know. You know, it's sort of interesting, Mark, because some people they, they say, well, when you've already kind of made it, you want to get really conservative, and and diversification preserves wealth, concentration grows wealth, right? right. But you know, you can also afford to lose more. Right. It's not going to affect your lifestyle necessarily if you're wealthy and you lose, uh, you know, whatever you consider to be a lot of money, right? Your lifestyle won't change right. because of it. You'll be depressed about it <laughs> and and bummed out, but but it won't really matter, you know, directly. So how do you reconcile that? You know, well, uh, because it all comes back down to your own personal circumstances and mentality. So, for example, before we started recording, we were talking about how I grew up racing dirt bikes and. I have a TV show where we ride dirt bikes. I do it a lot. And just the other day I crashed and I'm hurt right mm-hmm. now. And I, yeah. I'm a little bit banged up, cracked rib, separated shoulder. And so the reason why I bring that up is that my risk tolerance is obviously very high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most people <laughs> my age would be like, heck no, I ain't getting on a dirt bike. I could get hurt. Yeah, right. And I say, yes, of course you're going to get hurt. It's not yeah. a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? So what I mean by that is that my risk tolerance is high. And so also that carries through into my investing Mm-hmm. I'm not afraid to lose some money because I know right. it's inevitable. I know I'm going to mm-hmm. lose money and that's okay because I'm going to make it back. Where some people are not okay with that. Right. And yeah. so it, it really comes down to your own personal perspective. And, and you and I are not the same. Nobody's the same. And even, right. like I said, and you, you mentioned age, age is one of those things where as I get older, I need to be less risky than I was mm-hmm. when I was younger. So right. on a dirt bike, I'm less risky than I was when I was younger. My investing is less risky than I was, you know. So yeah. it changes person to person. It changes over time. And each person needs to find their own tolerance. Okay, makes sense. Good stuff. So in terms of what's coming next, I mean, uh, just maybe the general economic question, inflation or deflation, like that's always the easy, well, it's not easy, but it's, no, it's, not it's, easy. The, it's only it's only two choices. Uh, there are some variations like stagflation in there. And by the way, that's what I think is coming. But, you know, what do you think, Mark? I mean, we've got all of this money creation. It's insane. We've never seen this before. You know, I was looking at an interesting chart this morning, by the way, I wish I had it handy. Maybe I'll find it during our talk. But it was the percentage of GDP for various countries for coronavirus, you know, what they've dedicated to battling the pandemic and, and the economic devastation from it and so forth. And man, 
It's huge. I mean, these countries are spending a huge portion of their entire productivity, their GDP on this this pandemic. You know, is that going to be inflationary? So technically, yes. Right. So you have to understand kind of money creation. So money is created through debt. And so as they create more money, as they create more debt, it's like a balloon, it's inflating the balloon. And and just like anything, the more the more money they create, the less the existing money is worth. And so I try to really boil this down to something super, super basic. And people want to get all complex. And I think these economic PhDs, they get so smart, they forget the basics. And the basic is supply and demand. Mm -hmm. everything in life comes down to supply and demand, scarcity, scarcity. Mm -hmm. That's it. So when there's more supply than there is demand, the prices drop. Nobody wants it. There's too much of it. Nobody wants it. Right. But if there's more demand than supply, prices go up. And so when you think about it, when you have money inflation, it's inflating like a balloon. We're creating more money supply but demand, the demand hasn't changed, and so it's it's just going to affect that. Um, I guess to answer your question, what's going to happen? We're in this interesting, re- really, the whole world changed from 1971, which is when we got off the gold standard, right? And so for 5,000 years, value wealth, and this kind of leads us into Bitcoin a little bit, but it's about money, right? So for 5,000 years, money and wealth was related to gold. We had a, a standard unit of measure. Right. So everything in the world has a standard unit of measure. We both know what an inch is. We both know what a foot is, a mile is, a gallon yep. is, a pound is, a whatever, right. right? I mean, I know what a what a, what a degree is. Like we all have standard units of measure. Mm-hmm. And for 5,000 years, we had a standard unit of measure for money, for wealth, mm-hmm. value. Yep. And today we don't. In 1971, that got severed. And what happened is that allowed us to create unlimited amount of debt. So since 1971, we've created like several hundred trillion dollars of wealth out of uh, debt. I'm sorry, debt out of nowhere. And the reason why it's under, uh, important to understand is since 1971, 1987, 2000, 2008, et cetera, the markets keep trying to contract, meaning that debt is deleveraging. So they've leveraged up the debt. They've inflated the bubble. And it keeps trying to contract down and deflate, right? Mm -hmm. And you're you're asking, what comes first, inflation or deflation? But the problem is every time we see deflation, they reinflate it with more debt. But the problem is the debt gets bigger, 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 and it gets harder and harder and harder to fill that balloon back up. And so you're asking the question, do we see inflation or deflation? Well, we already know that, you know, in the U.S., they've committed, what, six trillion dollars to reinflating this at this bubble, this this balloon. And to compare that to 2008, it was 700 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but it was 700 billion in 2008. Now we're at six trillion. So that's how much harder it gets. Yeah. Um, and you already just said, like all these countries, you've seen how much GDP they're putting towards this. The problem is we have all this debt and debt disappears in an instant. Mm -hmm. So when uh, the airlines or let's say like the oil industry right now, the the oil industry is defaulting on hundreds of billions of dollars of debt. In an instant, it's gone. It's just gone. So that's deflation. And the Fed's trying to fight that with with reinflation. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the uh, you know, we can all just this is like a super simplistic idea. Right. But we can all understand this, relate to it. And we've certainly seen it in our own lives. Debt makes people look richer than they really are. And it makes countries look richer than they really are. Yep. So since 1971, when Nixon took us off the gold standard, you know, there was no no tether anymore. There was no more measuring stick. And the the U.S., the U.S. citizens, other countries around the world, because everything became fiat, then, and fiat just means by authority, right? You know, money has value because the government says so, right? Right. And um, and there's been this wealth effect, but a lot of it is just smoke and mirrors. It wasn't really there ever, you know? Right. The way wealth is created is through capital formation and pro- production, productivity, Right. That, those are the real things that actually create real wealth. Yeah. Um, but you can create fake wealth by financializing the economy and, you know, a lot of financial instruments, financial innovation. Whenever I hear a Wall Street guy say that, I'm like a run for the hills, yeah. <laughs> you know, but but temporarily it will make you seem rich. Right. You know, it just doesn't last forever. Yeah. 
And, that, so, and that's exactly where we're at. So the, uh, you're 100 percent right that money is or wealth is created through producing, producing goods and services. And when I produce a good and service, I get compensated with with wealth. And so you're right. What we've done over the last especially 50 years is we've outsourced all the production. Mm -hmm. And instead, we've become a financialized economy. Yeah. And exactly now you're you're t you're speaking of the like the US, the US. outsourcing to Japan or to, to China mostly, sure. uh, but formerly Japan. That's what you're talking about, right? right. And then financializing its own economy. Got right. Yeah. And so just uh, yeah, I was just kind of adding on to what you were saying, right? So we financialized the economy. So we've created hundreds of trillions of dollars of debt, which is basically fake wealth as you're calling it, right? Where it's like this illusion of wealth. In addition, I mean the, there's like over a quadrillion dollars of derivatives, whatever that means. Yeah. Of derivatives, those are bets on the financial system. And just to break it down super simple, they're bets. Again, you know, it's it's gambling on the financial system. So, um, yeah, it, it makes everybody seem richer. But the problem is, like I said, that debt can go away in the blink of an eye. With real estate, for example, is a real tangible asset. That's wealth. It's land, right. it's building, yeah. et cetera. And maybe that house could lose 50% of its value. Yeah. But like it doesn't disappear. Right. The land yeah. is there. The house is there. But with debt, it's just gone. When it's yeah. gone, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Okay. I found that chart I was talking about just to give you and the listeners and viewers a point of reference. I just thought I'd share this with you. So Japan has spent the most in terms of coronavirus stimulus packages, 21% of its GDP. U.S. is number two, 13%. Sweden, 12%, Germany, 10%, and on down from there. But Japan, 21%, and Japan of any developed country has more debt than anybody. They're like, their debt to GDP ratio is like 230% or some insane number like that. It's crazy. What's, the low end? What, what's on the low end? Well, on this chart, it doesn't do every country, but it does like the top, what is that, 10 maybe? South Korea, 2.2%. Yeah. So Everybody's, not bad. And yeah. they've done really well with it. Yeah. And they, a lot of people have really uh, uh, applauded South Korea's response to coronavirus, saying they did a really good job with it. So, yeah. Yeah. And it only took 2%. Amazing. Yep. Yeah. But that's a whole other subject for another conversation. But yeah. um, ultimately, I guess it does tie in a little bit in a sense where, as you're saying, which is absolutely right, which is all this financialized economy, this debt, it gives the illusion of wealth. What it also does is because it wasn't money that you had to earn. Mm hmm. You treat it differently. Right. And you're spending other people's money. So if I worked my butt off, like I got kids, right? I'm trying to get the kids to like, hey, work a little bit because you'll value it more, right? Um, right? When you work hard for that money, you treat it different. But when you're spending someone else's debt that create money creation that came out of thin air, mm -hmm. you're much more likely to just squander it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a that's a very good point. Very good point. You know, when you when you got to earn it yourself, you're going to treat it better. And like the old saying, money always goes where it's treated best. Yeah, I love <laughs> so, that saying. I love that yeah. saying. Yeah. And uh, we'll see if that happens between uh, the, this huge war between California and Tesla right now. <laughs> you know, that, that was uh, that's interesting. So I live in California. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's super interesting. And, and one of the most there's there's a lot of facets we could talk about. But the one most interesting facet that I found was back to your point when he goes was treated best, right? So Elon Musk thinks that Tesla isn't being treated uh, right and it should move. Well, I live in California, like I said, so we've lost all the car manufacturers. They've already, yeah. they've already been gone. They're the last one left. If they leave, California stands to lose billions and billions of dollars. But Tesla could make billions of dollars from working in a cheaper state. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is he says, I should move. And one of the representatives, I forget what her name is, she basically tweeted F- Trump or F, yeah, F Tesla. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F Elon but, Musk. Yeah, and F that was uh, like Loretta Gonzalez or yeah, something like exactly. that. You so know, yeah. A, I think she's an assembly woman for uh -huh. the great state of California. But but look at the contrast is what I want to bring out. Yeah. So she says F you. Mm -hmm. And Nevada and Texas say, say if welcome. you come here, we yeah. will roll out the red carpet. We <laughs> will get you tax incentives. We will get you employees. So, I mean, are you going to stay in a place that says F you or are you going to no. go to a place that rolls out the red carpet? And so just yeah. look at that, right? Like it's just amazing. Yeah, it's it's really, you know, California is my home state too. I live there the vast majority of my life. And I've never seen a state try so hard to commit suicide. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's like they want to ruin their economy. It's 
Yeah, it's, it's 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 just weird, but uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of wealth there. There's a lot of people that came there many years ago and just won't leave that easily. You know, it's sticky, right? It's not that easy to move. It's it's a hard it's a hard decision. It's hard to do. You know, so so yeah. it's it's really interesting. Hey, um, talk to us a little bit about cryptocurrencies, if you will. I haven't talked about that much on the show lately, and I used to talk about it a lot. You know, and and this is something that I say to my listeners, Mark, I would love to be wrong about this. You know, I'm not a Bitcoin bull, but I'd love to be wrong. I really would. I'd, I'd love nothing more than to see a decentralized, like democratized currency. I just think that the Fed and the government, they're just too powerful you know, and, and other central banks. And I kind of view it as that, like, the chief product of any government is literally their currency. Like, yeah. the dollar is the product they produce, right? Tesla makes cars. You know, other companies make widgets. Well, governments make currency, right? That's their product. So, so a couple a couple things I'd say about yeah. that. One, you, you mentioned earlier that fiat means it's, like, government-mandated, right? Right. Well, fiat means it's fake money. And, yep. and what, what, and the thing is, is that, uh, people think that the government has the military and they're going to force people to use the dollar, but that's mm-hmm. not how it works. Mm-hmm. There has to be trust. Without trust, nobody will use it. That's why in Venezuela right now, it's lined with with paper dollars and nobody will even bother to pick them up. Right. Nobody yeah. cares. It doesn't matter how much the government mandates you to use it. If nobody wants it, nobody wants it. And that's just the end of the story. Zimbabwe, we can talk about this all day. Zimbabwe has 100 trillion dollar banknotes. Yeah. And so when there's no trust, no one's going to use it. I don't care how big the, the military is. So that being said, the government has a monopoly on it because they did this sly, tricky thing where all dollars were backed by gold. In 1971, they removed that, but the dollar didn't really change. And most people don't really even understand what happened there. And that's all fine and good as long as things continue to work as they are. But if, at some point, that may fail. But what I would also do is I would roll things back a little bit. And I would say, like, if you looked at, you know, uh, maybe in the 14, 1500s, really like the Catholic Church and the government were like together as one, right? And uh, the people weren't allowed to read the Bible. And then we came, we got the printing press and the Bible. Bibles were mass produced and eventually the information got spread. So the information, the point that I want to make is information was centralized Mm -hmm. and you had to go to the church. They had to go to the Catholic church to get the information and they told Mm -hmm. you what they wanted you to know. It wasn't available for you to think on your own. Mm -hmm. Once the printing press came out, it decentralized the information attached to the Bible and the the Catholic church broke, lost the stranglehold. And eventually we got the separation of church and state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Today, things become democratized. Things become yeah. democratized today, right. as you're saying. The, there's a monopoly, a centralization of money, a value, and the government holds the monopoly on that, as you're saying, and you're and you're accurate in saying that. But things can become decentralized, and so eventually, I believe we're on a very short path to seeing a separation of money and state. And I believe mm-hmm. we need to go. And so really, if you look at what well, did you have a question about that? Well, yeah, look at every law and every government mandate comes down to being at the wrong end of the point of a gun. You know, that's the bottom line. You know, if if you don't pay your taxes, first, you'll get some letters. Then, you know, you'll get some phone calls. Then you'll get, uh, you know, police yeah. battering down your door and coming yeah. in and, and putting you in a cage. Right. So that's the result of any law. Right. So, you know, I look at it like, you know, uh, cocaine. Right. It's an illegal drug. But it has a market and a value, and people do trade in it as they trade in other illegal substances, but not many. You know, it's never going to be a big thing. It's never going to compete with the dollar because it's illegal. Cart- you haven't seen the cartels and the hundred yeah. billion the yeah. well, dollars they oh, have. Then. <laughs> they, they, they got a lot, but compared to the GDP of the U.S. economy, it's a drop in the bucket, right? But yeah, it's a lot for Pablo Escobar, right? <laughs> you know, sure. or whatever, right? Well, what I'd say to that, a couple of things I'll say to that first is that one, it doesn't have to be necessary. It, it depends on what you consider a success. And I guess it depends on what we're trying to talk about here. Uh, right. Meaning, uh, first of all, like the gold market is $10 trillion. Mm-hmm. And not everybody uses gold. Most people right. don't even own gold. Good point. But yet it's $10 trillion. The offshore banking sector is about $40 trillion. Not everybody has offshore bank accounts. Right. That, that's not even that's not even the standard, but yet it's yeah. forty trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. So could Bitcoin capture a little bit of that offshore banking? Could it capture a little bit of the gold market? If so, it could easily get to five, ten trillion dollars, which puts it at a couple hundred thousand dollars per Bitcoin. 
And that's without. Well, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Do you know the size that like the market cap of Bitcoin now that's available Bitcoins? Because there's only like two million left or something, right? Um, the market cap as of today is it changes radically as we 100, know. 100, 163 billion dollars. Okay, so it's tiny. In, yeah, in the it's big tiny. Scheme so, of yeah. so I, I have a video on my channel how Bitcoin gets to a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and basically a hundred thousand dollars per coin. And it's simple. Like all it has to do is capture two or three percent of the gold market, two or three percent of the offshore banking sector, and mm-hmm. like it can be there. And like offshore banking is not mainstream. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it depends. Like, uh, do, are we talking about like, will it go from you know ten thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, or will it become the reserve currency of the world? Those are different mm-hmm. conversations, of course. Right. Uh, I believe so. As an investor, I believe it's the single best investment we have today. I think there's a very probable chance. So we think about things in probabilities. I think there's a very probable chance we could see it get to a hundred thousand dollars, which is from ten thousand to a hundred thousand is an amazing gain. Or it could lose a hundred. It could lose a hundred percent. So you could lose a hundred percent, or you have an upside of a thousand percent. Those yeah. are odds I like. And that equation is a pretty good equation. You're right. And by the way, we should tell the audience because they don't know you yet. You know, you're a real estate guy. Like you love real estate investing, and you talk about it a lot. And you know, this is something you do with a small portion of your portfolio for that possible home run swing, right? Yeah, I mean, I also I also invest into gold and I also invest into stocks and all that. So, but I all of that is put together into like I said my growth allocation and then when I take profits from there, I take those profits and I put them over into cash flow and into real estate. Mhm. Yeah. Um, so there's a quote that I can't remember who said it and I I have so many uh, I think it was F.A. Hayek, who's one of the great Austrian economics of our oh, time. Yeah. Yeah. And he said that there shall never be a sound money again until it is taken from the hands of the government. But it can't be done by force, but rather through a sly roundabout way that they don't know until it's too late. Which is basically, interestingly, what they've been doing to us for years through inflation, (laughs) the sly roundabout way to destroy our wealth. And so Bitcoin fits that narrative perfectly because Mm -hmm. um, it's this sly roundabout way. If the if the government, the Fed, whoever you want to say, would have seen what was going on 10 years ago, they would have stopped it. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's too big. It's too prevalent. So I'm not saying that all the governments of the world can't come together and, and make it illegal and they'll kill you if they catch you with it. And that would definitely limit the ability. I'm not saying that won't happen. There, that's, there's a chance that could happen. There is mm-hmm. a chance. But yep. there's also a chance that doesn't happen, right? And when you look at it, so like Representative Brad Sherman from California, another great Californian guy, he, he spoke to the Senate committee and said, we need to outlaw cryptocurrency because it undermines our monopoly on money. And what it does as the U.S. is it takes away our ability to slap sanctions on countries like Iran. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. But Iran was sitting there listening going, oh, really? Well, then I think we should use it. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) And so all of a sudden now the the fact that the U.S. would want to make it illegal makes other countries want to adopt it. And and what it it creates game theory. Mm -hmm. And so now the U.S., I'm not saying they are. The U.S. makes it illegal, and then all of a sudden it go lives in that free part of the world. So mm-hmm. that's one. That's one thing. The other thing that I would say is that uh, we know that uh, that policy is set by lobbying, right? The people lobby the government, and they get their way with the government, right? Right. And yeah. and I would say that I don't know who's bigger, but probably the two biggest lobby are are pharma and finance. Mm -hmm. So finance is definitely one of the biggest uh, lobby arms in there. And we know that Goldman Sachs, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, NYSE, BACT, all these companies have spent collectively billions of dollars to start building out Bitcoin products. And so they're not going to be happy to see the government change policy and make that illegal after they've already spent billions of dollars to bring those products in. I would bet they're going to spend a lot of money lobbying to keep that active so they can make that money. Mm-hmm. How so, do you recommend buying Bitcoin? How do I recommend buying it? Yeah, I mean, on on like the common exchanges, or do you you know do you recommend doing it some other way? Or uh, I mean, the you know. easiest way, um, maybe not the most ideal way, but the easiest way is go to Coinbase dot com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Set up an account. I mean, they're they're a U.S. based company, fully legit, fully transparent. Yeah. Um, you link up your account and you just click buy and it just buys it. Jack, uh, Dorsey from Twitter, Twitter. 
has a company called Square, and there's a company, and and they have what's called the Cash App, and then you can just download this Cash App on your phone, and it's kind of like a banking app. And uh, I can request money, send money, kind of like a Venmo kind of type deal. Mm-hmm. And I buy Bitcoin right in the Cash App. Okay, got it, got it. So, so, so he's he's selling it too. That's interesting. And uh, tell us about the halving that just happened. Yeah. Um, so I want to tell you about the halving, but I want to tell you just back to well, let's talk about the halving first. So mm-hmm. um, basically, what happened, and this is a very interesting thing, and I actually have a video dropping on my YouTube channel here in one minute uh, talking about the halving. Uh, so if anybody wants to know more, they can go watch that on the channel. But basically, what happens is it's very interesting. So the Bitcoin Bitcoin was created as a direct response to the 2008 Great Financial Crash. So in the very first line of code, the programmer, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, but the programmer wrote a line in the code and he he quoted the headline of a newspaper article. The chancellor is on the brink of a second bailout. And it was in response to this endless money printing that Bitcoin was created. And Bitcoin was created to be deflationary. So we talk about money and there's just no end to how much they make. And of course, the more they make, the less it's worth. The dollar's lost 98% of its purchasing power over the last 100 years. Well, Bitcoin was created as a response to that and it's made deflationary. It has a hard cap, never be more than 21 million Bitcoin ever. And what happens is over time, they're released. So um, and there's a new block. You've heard blockchain. So as the transactions gets processed, it's block by block by block, and it gets added every 10 minutes, a new block. And every 10 minutes, a new block releases Bitcoins into the system. And if you have – if you buy a computer and you hook into the network, which is permissionless, everybody's able to do this. Anyone can hook a computer in and start helping the network with security. If you participate in that – when coins are released, you get a share of that, depending on how much share you're putting in on work. Now, um, in the beginning, it was 50 coins, 50 Bitcoin every every block, every 10 minutes. But what happens is that that schedule goes down every four years. It gets cut in half. So then it was 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. Right now, we've been 12.5 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And as of uh, as of yesterday, it became six point two five Bitcoin every mm. 10 minutes. And yeah. so back to what I said about supply and demand, right? Things are super simple right now. As of yet before yesterday, we were creating um, one thousand eight hundred new Bitcoin were created every single day. Eighteen hundred Bitcoin. It's about at today's price, roughly sixteen million dollars. Right. So the market, the the, the demand. And the supply, the supply is 1,800 new Bitcoin every day. The demand is absorbing that. And the price is stable with that supply and demand. If the demand stays the same, but you cut the supply in half, what happens? The price should go up. Right. right? Should. Yeah. So yeah. so that's the big deal with the halving. So we're on this supply schedule, this fixed supply schedule. Every four years, the, the amount, the inflation, right, you can call it the inflation of Bitcoin gets cut in half every four years. And basically all the way, we have about 120 more years until it runs out and we max out the 21 million Bitcoin and there's no more. So, Mark, I know I know we got to wrap it up here, but um, uh, this is fascinating. And, you know, one more thing I hear from the skeptics is they'll say, well, OK, Bitcoin is limited. You've got like 21 million allowed or something like that. Right. But the market for cryptocurrency in general is totally unlimited. I mean, you've got all these others out there, right? Ethereum and a zillion others. What do you say to that? Like, is it is it just a, you know, a, a cryptocurrency thing or is it all about Bitcoin? Um, in, and, my mind, uh, yeah. in, in my mind, it's all about Bitcoin. And what I would say to that is you have one Mona Lisa mm-hmm. and it's worth a lot of money. You have two paintings right behind you. Do those mm-hmm. two paintings diminish mm-hmm. the value of Mona Lisa? Uh, oh, no, they don't. <laughs> they don't. There's, yeah. there's thousands of paintings. There's millions of paintings in the world. Right. Sure. Do those millions of paintings diminish the value of the Mona Lisa? Yeah. No, right. they don't. And the reason mm-hmm. why is because Mona Lisa has characteristics that are unique to the Mona Lisa. Mm-hmm. And Bitcoin has characteristics that are unique to Bitcoin that no one else has. No one mm-hmm. else can do. No one else, no other coin, no other cryptocurrency could ever replicate or duplicate. Well, I don't want to say ever, but have not so far been mm-hmm. able to, and I, and I would, I would almost say never, probably never could ever duplicate what Bitcoin has. And so what, what does Bitcoin have? It has 
immutability. It has scarcity and it has censorship resistant. And this is the big thing, right? So uh, you've seen in Weimar Republic, you've seen in Cyprus in 2015, Australia has bail-in laws. The government goes broke. They just take your money. They seize gold. The U.S. seized gold in 1933, right? So mm-hmm. uh, the government just takes your money when they want it. Bitcoin is censorship resistant. Nobody can seize it, steal it. Nobody can manipulate it, prevent it. We saw like in WikiLeaks, we saw Julian Assange was holed up and people were sending him money. And then uh, the government just said, nope, you can't send him money anymore. So people started sending him Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so Bitcoin is freedom. Bitcoin is sovereignty. If I hold Bitcoin, nobody can steal it. Nobody can seize it. Nobody can manipulate it. Nobody can inflate it away. Like those dollars in your bank account, the government's inflating them away, or they could take them out of your bank if they wanted either way, right? But nobody can seize it. And in addition, if I want to pay you for something with dollars through PayPal, Venmo, wire transfer, there's 50 people in line that could stop that transaction. Mm -hmm. But 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 Bitcoin is peer-to-peer. If I want to pay you, nobody can stop it, block it, or prevent it. It's mm-hmm. freedom. It's 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 sovereignty. And that and I believe that freedom and sovereignty will always win. Yeah. And that's a uh, a really good libertarian view. I like it. I guess the only way they could stop it is they could somehow block the packets on the Internet. Like, you know, they can block voice packets. Right. Because they're different than other bits and bytes. You know, that, I don't I mean, know. That's the, above my pay grade. But, but, theoretically, you know, but technically, yeah. no. Right. So people are already doing uh, Bitcoin transactions over ham radios. Mm-hmm. They're doing them through uh, – there's a new thing called wow. – there's a new thing called Mesh Networks. Mm-hmm. And so it's getting really, really big. Where it's like uh, it's, there's a new there's a new uh, sector called dissident tech. And so mm-hmm. as governments become more tyrannical, we're seeing dissident, for example, that we see it in New York as well. But there's called Mesh Networks. And basically right. they're little mini um, – um, you, you know what that is? Like yeah, mini yeah. They, they, and they, they use multiple radio waves. They, they'll use yeah. your Bluetooth, your Wi-Fi, and the, the cellular – yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So they're they're transferring Bitcoin on mesh networks. Yeah, they're transferring okay. Bitcoin on ham radios. And so uh, they, they have they have satellites up. So there's satellites mm-hmm. up. If the if the ISP takes internet down, you have the energy of the the satellites up. So um, you're right. I mean, there, there's going to be this. There could be this cat and mouse. There's all these what ifs, right? And and yeah. they're all and we and we have to recognize those. We don't want to ignore them, but we want to assign them probabilities. Is that probable that the and people and I hear it all the time on my channel. What if, if the whole internet goes down? And I'm like, yeah. if you think there's a world with no internet, like I know. <laughs> we have we have bigger problems. So I mean, yeah. is right. that probable? I guess, but I give it such a small yeah, percentage right. of prop, right? So you have Fair to look at all these things. And yeah. uh, I do, I will give you though that money is money is power, and the the Fed, the central banks, whoever you want to call it, control the world with the money, and yeah. they do not want to lose control of that. Yeah. And they will yeah. throw every tool in their arsenal at this. Right. And so it's going to be a battle. And I'll give you that. Yeah. And I think they'll they'll come along with their own cryptocurrency, their own digital dollar, you know, at some point that's that's going to happen because but the problem is when that happens, there will be zero financial privacy. I mean, they will know our every move. I mean, one of the you know ultimate forms of freedom is the ability to trade without Big Brother watching you, you know, to buy what you want. Can you imagine an in a really ugly dystopian 1984-ish uh, world where, you know, every time you make a purchase on the internet or something, the government questions, well, what was that for? It's like posting something on Facebook that they consider questionable and they'll, they'll hide it or ghost it or, you know, or they yeah. don't agree with the politics. I mean, it's absolutely scary. Yeah. It's, e- it's even worse. So like those government cryptocurrencies that it's programmable money. So right. they can program it. So, for yeah. example, if you're on, if you're receiving government assistance, for example, yeah. when they transfer that money, they can prog- they can program that money where you can only spend it on these certain things. Right, it can't be on these things. If you don't, if you don't spend it within a certain time, it automatically comes back to them. Mm-hmm. So, like, it can be programmed any way they want before they even give it to you. Yeah, yeah, uh, and 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 that will create all sorts of black markets. <laughs> but what <laughs> I would what I would just say is uh, 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 the overarching theme is what I started with is it always has to come down to trust. And so yeah. no government force, and I, they threaten you with the barrel of a gun. I, I understand yeah. that. But yeah. no amount of force can make you use something when humans don't want to trade for it. So when in Venezuela, they go to buy that bread with those dollars and they say, I don't want those dollars, but I mm-hmm. will take water. I'll take mm-hmm. batteries. Yeah, I'll right. take fruit, right? I don't want those Venezuelan dollars. And so um, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there's always going to be free will. There's always going to be free trade and, and no amount of force can 
affect that, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good, because, you know, I remember uh, when I was in Romania, our guide was a uh, a high-level person under the, you know, Ceausescu communist regime, right? And she was a media reporter. And so she got to live a much nicer life than other people did. But of course, she had to toe the state line, which was completely bogus. And uh, she talked about how they would ration everything. And maybe one or two times a year, the country would get, you ready for this? Chocolate. <laughs> and And the whole country would be like, in heaven, they'd be stoned on chocolate because they got chocolate right and you know she said that they would dole out shoes there would be a a certain time when the government would announce that hey we've got shoes and you can go get shoes based on you know whatever your name is or i don't know i don't know how they did it but people would wait in line to get a pair of shoes mark for you know 24 36 hours and they'd get to the they'd get their place and they'd go into the place to get their free communist shoes and they wouldn't have their size and i said well what did you do well we had to develop our own market and trade them behind the scenes because we had to get what fit properly right and that's exactly what you're saying people people always develop their own gray or black markets for everything so that's true capitalism is a very natural thing isn't it it is it is (laughs) yeah 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 that's good hey uh give out your website this has been great talking to you give out your website tell people where they can find out more yeah for sure i mean i put out content a couple times a week on youtube just just search mark moss you'll find it there um like i said i just dropped a video as it it released right now on this whole bitcoin having so if you want to know more about that i have a whole video about that i talk about all these different topics that we've kind of covered on this show so if you like any of those topics making money investing money and having success in life then uh, check out the channel it's the best place place to see me we love it hey mark thanks a lot for joining us yep thank you so much Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.